Coming up on One Detroit, enjoying museums again. The head of Henry Ford, Patricia Meradian, talks about the changes. Plus, the Plowshares Theater shares a virtual concert. Also ahead, covering protest against police brutality, a photojournalist story. And then, so you've watched the musical Hamilton? Now meet the producer, Jeffrey Seller, who is from Metro Detroit. I'm Satori Shakur. It's all ahead on One Detroit. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation, the DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation. And viewers like you. Hi, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. I'm Satori Shakur, joining you from the Mary Grove Theater. And shout out to Lynette Halloway, Knit So Fabulous. I'm wearing one of her designs, her shrug. As coronavirus continues to change our world, here at Detroit Public Television, we're finding ways to keep up with the creative, musical, and cultural events we're all missing right now. This show is all about filling that arts and culture void and connecting with the things that bring us so much joy. Coming up on the show, Christy McDonald talks with the president of the Henry Ford, Patricia Meradian, on the changes that visitors are seeing now that the museum is back open, plus the Plowshares Theater on their play, Hastings Street. Then covering the protest against police brutality, meet photojournalist Mandy Wright, also ahead, if you're one of the millions of people who has streamed Hamilton the Musical, fun fact, the show's producer Jeffrey Seller grew up in Metro Detroit and he's given back to art students here. And we'll wrap it up with a throwback performance from the Concert of Colors. It's all just ahead. Well, joining me now is Patricia Meradian. She is the president of the Henry Ford. The Henry Ford is back open, so give visitors a sense of the changes and, and what they'll be experiencing now. So now we have two venues open. Um, we have the, the, the village open, Greenfield Village, and the museum is open. Um, we are not open seven days a week like we typically are. We're open four days, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. We have reduced capacity, so it's a, a little less crowded than we've had in the past. Uh, we allow for um, all online reservations, so everybody needs to go online and reserve your time. And the whole point of that is so that we can keep capacity at the levels in which it's safe. Uh, we do have decals on the, on the ground for the places where there may be lines so that people can uh, space out and be comfortable. Uh, we do require masks. Uh, for both venues in the museum of hands-on exhibitions are not, are not open for touching. The ones that we were able to keep open, we have hand sanitizer stations and we have um, cleaning, extra cleaning staff. How do you as an institution start to try to plan ahead when we really have a bit of an uncertain future when it comes to revenue? There could be more rolling stops uh, that we have to pull everything back again. What is that like to do a kind of large scale planning? It's, it's, very, it's very difficult. Um, we have a tremendous team and we have a really great board and the board is helping us um, think through some of these circumstances. Obviously, we had to get open first, so we're looking at it in time increments. So the first step was, you know, what are we dealing with and how long do we have to be closed and what does that look like? Okay, now we can start planning the reopen. What does that look like? So we're getting through in these time chunks, but right now what we're doing is we're paying really close attention to people's comfort level and coming back. We're talking to our members and guests, we're doing surveys, 
and we're paying attention to um, what we're able to, to see from their behaviors and what that could predict for the future. And then we're doing a lot of business modeling. When you look at how nimble cultural organizations have had to be during this time and creative as well and continuing to, to connect with their base, what would you say, is there anything that has made your organization more nimble? One of the biggest, I think, um, creative things that has come out of, of this for us is we, we started a, a campaign called Reactivate the Henry Ford um, because it is such a vibrant part of this community. It's such a community treasure. It's unlike any other nonprofit in the country and maybe even the world in, its, um, in, in the kinds of collections we have and the artifacts that we have, which are so significant for learning right. about innovation and invention and, and being resourceful. And so the Reactivate the Henry Ford applies to uh, people coming back to visit, uh, people becoming members or people donating. And so we started a Reactivate the Henry Ford Fund as well to help us shore up what will be um, a 10 to $20 million deficit at the end of 2020. That's staggering. Um, it is staggering. <laughs> what exhibits can we look forward to so people can come and enjoy? So I'm, I'm excited about the Marvel exhibition. Uh, that was scheduled to open on March 26th. So we literally had, you know, we closed down two weeks before our biggest exhibit. So it opens on uh, this week, July 16th. They'll see over 300 uh, different artifacts in this exhibit relating to all the Marvel superheroes, the comic books, illustrations, costumes, props. Um, so we're very happy that we're able to show this exhibition. Um, and if we have to make a change, we'll pivot and we'll, we'll make that change. The Plowshares Theater in Detroit, Michigan's only professional African-American theater, held a virtual concert online in 2020. It features songs from an original musical called Hastings Street. The show is set back in 1949, when the Black Bottom neighborhood was about to be torn apart to make way for the construction of I-75. Will Glover caught up with Plowshares co-founder Gary Anderson, along with writers John Sloan III and Chris Johnson. So let's get right into it. You guys are taking on the endeavor of creating a play and a virtual concert around Hastings Street, which has a lot to do with the highways that were built during urban renewal and um, the neighborhoods like Black Bottom that were destroyed in the process. So. Uh, Gary, we'll start with you. Um, was this something that was in the works already before, you know, the world kind of got put on pause and also exploded at the same time? Or, or was this something that um, was sparked by everything that's going on? Yeah, so this has been in the works for almost a year now. And we're at a point now where we have a full script, we've got a full score. And we were just actually ready to begin scheduling both a workshop and a concert. We're going to do the full, all 20 songs in a live concert that we were looking at doing in July of, you know, the summer. And then we got hit with the pandemic. And so we regrouped after a while and thought about how we could maybe salvage that idea and present it in a smaller format on, in a digital uh, platform. John, what was your uh, you know, initial thought when you started taking on this project? I really wanted to make sure we got it right. And as somebody that is from this community, left, moved away, I lived in New York for a while, I was on tour for a while, um, I moved back home in, in 2017, and I really felt like there were a lot of parallels, and I still feel like there are a lot of parallels between what was happening in Detroit in the late 40s, early 50s, and what's happening in our community right now. Um, and the way that we're dealing with this, um, this struggle at the nexus of gentrification and redevelopment. Um, and when you're really thinking about building out, like I, I personally hate the idea of a new Detroit um, because Detroit has been here and, and my family's been here. We've, we've all been here and been working and been trying to, to deal with having a lack of access to opportunity and having a lack of access to education and redevelopment and still being one of the foundational um, communities in the world. Um, especially when you think about what we've contributed to the, the history of arts um, and of, of arts activism. 
you know, I wanted to make sure writing the book and helping to create these characters that we stayed true to our community um, and really helped to tell a story that was both unique to Detroit, but it had themes that were archetypal um, and universal. So Chris, what was your first thought when, when you were approached to do this project? Yeah, it was really interesting is that uh, Gary and I actually worked together on my first musical, Jim Crow's Tears. Gary wrote the book for it and I wrote the lyrics and the, and the music. And after I completed that project, I was kind of thinking if I ever did another musical, if I ever, you know, ventured into that, that world again, uh, what would it be about? And I started researching more, and this is, you know, almost a decade ago, started researching Black Bottom and got really kind of fascinated by the history of Black Bottom. So when this came up, I mean, it was just incredibly exciting to be able to actually put to use some of that research and some of that history in, in Detroit. And I think it's just a very, very, very timely uh, piece uh, and, it, and kind of mirroring what John was saying. I think we're seeing a lot of the same themes that are starting to take place now in Detroit and this whole idea of this like push and pull with uh, the white and black community. So I think it's just a really important reflection on what was so that people understand that, you know, Detroit's been here and will continue to be. John, tell me a little bit about what the actual story is. How are we going to be taken through that history and experience it? So one thing that the three of us talked about from the beginning is making sure that we were creating a piece and creating a story that while it was true to life was not re-traumatizing. Um, there's, there's a diversity of black experiences and we didn't want to see them get reduced down to archetypes, right? Um, and so what you're going to do is people that come see Hastings Street are going to follow the story of the Carson family. Um, and it's, it's one family who is established in the Black Bottom and Paradise Valley community. They have their own general store and they want to try to see their business stay and grow and maintain. Um, but all these things and all these forces are changing around them. In the middle of all that, the son of the family, Robert Jr., Bobby, comes home from World War II um, as a Tuskegee Airman and is dealing with all the things that war vets have to deal with, um, that struggle of PTSD. And so we try to use his struggle and the family's struggle to mirror the parallel conversations that were happening in the city around what it means to take on responsibility, around what it means to come home in a world that's changing and environment that's changing around you. Um, and then also balanced with just the joy and the energy that was the jazz and blues that came out of the 40s and 50s. And using that um, from, from an oral sense to create a tapestry um, and, a, and world build really around what the city is and around what the family has to work through and, and try to overcome together. So John, there's not just a play that's being created, but what we're coming up on first, if I'm correct, is a virtual concert. So explain to me what that is, how it works, what people can expect to see. So what we've done is we've really curated um, a selection of songs and scenes uh, that give the audience hopefully a wonderful understanding of the arc of the piece. And then there's some dialogue that happens uh, inherently too. Uh, but we also have you know, six amazing singers and actors um, that have lent us their talents. We have a, a band full of musicians um, that have lent us their skills and their, and their talents. Uh, and so hopefully you're gonna tune into this concert and you're going to see um, as close to an approximation as we could get with people in different locations to what a staged reading concert would have been. And it's an opportunity for the audience to sit back, relax, enjoy some wonderful new music um, and really be able to connect with characters that look like us and that sound like us and that I'm like you're going to hear your auntie and your uncle right like you're you're going to hear your cousins that's the goal is that we can reach out tangibly and say i know this family like this family is my family their story is my story the demonstrations and protests against police brutality here and across the country have changed the way many of us are thinking and talking about systemic racism. After George Floyd's death, there were clashes with protesters and police. People were arrested. Journalists were detained. Mandy Wright is an award-winning photojournalist, a longtime fixture on the local news scene here, and works for our partners at the Detroit Free Press. She talks about covering the demonstrations and the role journalists play. I'm Mandy Wright. I'm live right now, right next to the Marriott. Police are in riot gear, pushing protesters back. 
Photographer Mandy Wright has been with the Detroit Free Press 20 years. Things have really changed in the way you do your job with the internet and everything like that really taking hold. So when I started, we used film until digital became technically almost perfect. And once we went into digital, then we transformed into video. And then it was always about feeding the internet. We're making movies. The Detroit Free Press does documentary films now. Some of Wright's recent online work has gone big. You scared? Especially her coverage yeah, of unrest in Detroit after the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. The first five days of protests brought the free press many millions of views on Facebook. A simple live feed from a cell phone. Two, three hours straight that started May 29. Okay. It was pretty heated and then fights are broken out. Debris started to be lobbed from the protesters, whether it was water bottles. There was a lot of energy in the protest. People were very angry about the incident in Minneapolis. It started to turn that rage towards the Detroit police. We're now being pushed up. Randolph, it's getting pretty violent. And there was a point where somebody got shot and killed during all of this. Right, yes. When I was up in the parking structure, you can actually hear in my footage the shooting and I go down to the street level, and um, sure enough. And I saw blood on the ground. Oh, no. The victim, not a protester, not harmed by police, an altercation, gunplay, and two young men to be charged with the killing. Protest day two would play out like day one. More crowds and police in riot gear, minus the homicide. Day three, a Sunday, came with the curfew. But how would it be enforced? The crowd was determined to break the curfew, which was mandated for 8 o'clock. And the crowd was really, they were not going to move. They were not moving. The woman approaching the police. All right, we got tear gas. And the police started a full frontal assault to get the protesters out into the street. Protesters throwing things. And uh, tear gas just coming right at us. Day four was a day there was a 16-year-old kid that rallied the troops to disperse. Yeah, Stefan Perez, the 16-year-old kid from southwest Detroit, really wanted the group that they were marching with to, to disperse by curfew. After this, this band. He managed to successfully get, and I thought that might be a turning point in terms of how the protests would be handled from that point forward. Right now, the police are just just standing down. They home safe. They don't got rubber bullets. They don't got tear gas. They're not dead. That's all that matters right now. And it was just an endearing moment. While we're interviewing him, Mayor Duggan calls him on the telephone and congratulates him on the diplomacy in which he handled the, the marchers. I, I was watching the video and I saw your leadership. I have tears in my eyes. You are everything that's special about the city of Detroit. All right, we're told to step back. Day five, Tuesday, June 2nd, on the east side, Being Gratiot Avenue, and it's getting past 8 o'clock. We were close. We're trying to cover it. That's our jobs. And um, right. police I'm grabbed me. But I was lucky. I was let go. After Gratiot, protesters were still determined to defy curfew, but the Detroit police and the mayor's office decided to make curfew discretionary, which I think was a, you know, a very successful tactic in allowing people to voice peacefully their First Amendment right. Last thing I think about this, you're, you're covering it, really important stuff with an iPhone. Anybody could do what you were doing, but really, honestly, I don't think that's the could case. They? Could they? <laughs> what do could you they? think? <laughs> I don't know. I um, think that I'm a trained journalist, and I think that makes a big difference. I don't take a side. I try to uh, report as objectively as possible, and I think that was part and parcel why people came to the free press, because they didn't have to be spoon-fed uh, an opinion. That's not what I was there to do. I was there to tell what I was seeing and be the eyes for the, uh, our, you know, anybody who wanted to watch it. And finally, musical theater fans lost their mind when Hamilton dropped on Disney Plus last year.
The film of the stage show with the original Broadway cast has made Hamill fans out of millions. The producer of the musical, Jeffrey Seller, grew up in Metro Detroit, and he came back to town during Hamilton's run at the Fisher Theater. Chastity Pratt talked with him about the deliberate casting and why the show resonates with so many people. Jeffrey Seller, welcome home. Thank you. I love being here. You have this show with a diverse cast, people of color. Talk a little bit about how, how that affects the audience, how that affects the artistry, our understanding of history. Um, Hamilton is so organically correct in that it was always obvious to us um, that George Washington would be played by an African-American man, that Thomas Jefferson would be a man of color. What is so satisfying to me is that we have created a show that is about America yesterday told by America today because that enables every audience member, white, black, brown, whatever, to look up on that stage and say, that's my story too. It's interesting that you would bring Hamilton here right now because at the African American History Museum right now, there's the, the Paradox of Liberty exhibit and it's been problematic because it deals with Jefferson. Are we dealing with history in a different way by bringing in these, you know, these characters of color? Are we um, just making it more accessible? I think that Hamilton is absolutely exploring the possibility of what America can be while it's simultaneously showing us in theatrical ironic terms what it was not. So but we have a black say, man hey, playing Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson who was a black. slave, who was a slave holder. The fact that he wasn't black is less interesting to me than the fact that we have a black man playing him and he was a slaveholder. And that is powerful. And that is complicated. It's complicated. And that may create cognitive dissonance for um, white audience members who don't think he should be played by a black man and for black audiences who say, how could a black man portray that slaveholder? And I think that we are in a moment where we are thinking about the sins of our past, the sins of slavery, the, the conversation about reparations is starting to enter mm -hmm. our dialogue. Mm -hmm. And to the degree that Hamilton is part of that dialogue, I am happy. Hamilton can't tell every story. It can't explore every issue and it touches on it but it doesn't do a deep dive in it. And um, now the question is, what vehicles can we use to take that deep dive into America's sin? It's a complicated cognitive experience, right? And kids love it because of the music. Yeah. Let's talk about kids. How, what kind of a, a effect are you looking for with your younger audience? Well, kids love it because of the music. Yes. Kids love it because of the dancing. Kids love it um, and kids of color love it because they feel like, okay, I'm part of the story too. That's me up there. I am part of the American story. And I think that's very, very valuable. On the topic of kids, we can't let you get out of here without talking about that huge donation to Mosaic, a program that serves children, uh, mostly African-American children of color, yes. um, a million dollars, the biggest donation to a nonprofit like this we've seen. Why'd you do it? Why this organization? I know from my own experience the power of theater to transform a life. The work that Mosaic is doing with these kids is, it's like saving the world. Hamilton is streaming on Disney. Such an amazing show. That'll do it for One Detroit Arts and Culture. Check us out at onedetroitpbs.org. 
We always like to leave you with a performance. So enjoy a throwback set from the Concert of Colors in 2014. This is singer Mesa Kara performing Bob Seeker's Turn the Page. Enjoy and see you next week. شي مثل الكذب الحلو وعمره سنين كتير اتقال ما بعرف كيف عم بحس بس بصوتي صمت كبير وعد فكر انه قلبي من حبك موجوع ولا عم you can find more at OneDetroitPBS.org or subscribe to our social media channels and sign up for our One Detroit newsletter. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Business Leaders for Michigan. Dedicated to making Michigan a top 10 state for jobs, personal income, and a healthy economy. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.